want to welcome everybody in the auditorium, everybody who's listening or watching online to the conclusion of our Big Butts in the Bible series. I'm kind of sad. I really like this series. Matter of fact, we had a great time this past third Friday. We were downtown Wyandotte. And we, uh, matter, just to give you a little a tidbit, is we had 50-something like uh, households that we connected with. And out of those, I, I think there was seven or nine that said they, they wanted more information about uh, Wyandotte Family Church. So that was really exciting. So thank you to those of you who served. And if you never served, it comes around next month. And it's on a third Friday, by the way. People say, when's that third Friday? It's like, really? Really? <laughs> Uh, but I don't, I, don't, I don't say anything sarcastic unless I'm having a bad day. Um, but we had a great, great time there. And it's so fun because when you, we're passing out these things. And, you know, I mean, I've been to conventions. You know, I go to places and people try to give you stuff. And you're just like, eh, you know. And then everybody sees the big butts in the Bible and they stop. I love it. And I love it. Like, what is this? And, you know, and some, uh, some teenagers are like, hey, that's a big elephant butt, right? And... Uh, <laughs> So it, it was, it's just a fun series to connect, especially with those who aren't really interested in church right now. But it's, but it's been also been a powerful series. You know, for part one, we talked about, you know, but I have a past. And, and, the, and the slogan was, I have a past, but God gives me a future. Then for part two, we talked about, I'm in too much pain. And we talked about the pain that we go through. And the slogan was, I will, uh, with my pain, I will praise. And then last week, this, uh, the, the topic was, but I'm not qualified. And the slogan was, whatever God calls you to, he will see you through. through. This morning for part four is our, is our next one, but I feel all alone. Now, have you ever experienced this before where you walk into an environment and, and, and maybe you're surrounded by a lot of people, but you still feel alone? Raise your hand if that's you. Yeah. So, um, some of you have, didn't raise your hand, so either you're not listening to me or you never felt alone, which is awesome because uh, that, uh, that's something special, and so you need, you, need to, you need to hold on to that. But I remember one time I was at a, at a social function um, somewhere in the community, and uh, I was surrounded by a lot of people, a lot of people. And there was a lot of people that were drinking, and probably they were drinking a little bit too much, and uh, there was a lot of jokes that were being said that, that were kind of, you know, from my perspective, inappropriate, and so I wasn't laughing. And I, even though I was surrounded in this buzz of a room of people around me, I, I felt really all alone. And, and I'm sure that you and I have felt that way that maybe at school or maybe, you know, in, in, in family gatherings where everybody's around, but yet somehow you feel disconnected, whatever it may be. We all feel, um, have felt alone. And the, the, the challenging part is when you and I feel alone is often when we make some of those decisions that we later on regretting. Most, a lot of your, uh, your decisions that, that you, it's either you were with the wrong crowd and you weren't alone or, or you were alone. But we, we often um, struggle with that. And, and when you come to follow Jesus Christ, you would think that would make a difference. You would think that that would solve the issue of never feeling alone. And it, it does to some degree. For instance, like, you know, you just saw that video, the Supernatural video. That's the new theme or the new series that our men's group is launching on Wednesday nights. And if you've never been to the men's group on Wednesday nights, I would encourage you to check it out. It's, it's, it's a, a great group of guys. And what's so exciting about the guys isn't just the, the topic, but is that they're doing community together. And they're, they're building relationship. And they're looking out for each other. And they're texting each other. They're going fishing and doing all these different things together. And it's really cool to see happen. And then we have that starting to happen with our women. We have like three different women's groups that are, that are growing and they're, and they're really starting to connect. And it's really exciting to see. But even though we still have all that going on, there's still an element to feeling alone that following Jesus will not solve. And most people don't think about it that way. There's an element to feeling alone that even though you're surrounded by a bunch of other Christ followers, even though you're doing community, there's still going to be times in your life as a Christ follower where you are going to feel all alone. And when we get into that moment where we do feel all alone is really when we're going to have to make a decision. Is if we're going to um, do what we sang just a few minutes ago, which is, I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Or 
we can continue to follow Christ, you know, faithfully. And, and what's really interesting is that when you and I cross the line to a relationship with Jesus, we step into a new narrative. I don't know if you ever thought about it this way, but before you became a Christ follower, you were writing your own story. You were in charge. You were writing the chapters. You were writing the titles. You were determining the main characters. And you were in charge and on the throne. And you, you were writing your own story. But when you become a Christ follower, you recognize, hey, I'm writing my own story, but I don't like how it's going to end. <laughs> You know, I thought I was going this way, but now I realize it's going to end here, and I don't like the ending. And we realize, you know, wow, I need God. I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness. Please rewrite my story. And we enter his narrative. We join the story of God. And that's what's so powerful about serving God is we get to do that. But what begins to happen, though, we don't talk about, I think, enough about, is that when you and I start writing our own story and we start following God's narrative, all of a sudden it becomes noticeable to our immediate surroundings. And all of a sudden, those maybe who are your coworkers or those who are your family members or those who are your friends start noticing, all of a sudden, you're now, you're now a part of a different story. And when that happens, it's easy for us to begin to feel pressure, begin to feel um, maybe even, you know, um, persecution or pressure to conform. For instance, if you're in high school, man, that's really felt because if you follow God's narrative and not your friend's or school's narrative, then all of a sudden, you know, you may not be with the popular kids anymore. Or if you follow God's narrative at work, instead of others' narratives, then all of a sudden you might get persecuted, or might get labeled, or you might get, you know, mocked. If, if you follow God's narrative at home, and maybe other people in your home aren't, then you could be easily misunderstood, or mis, uh, um, you know, looked at as pious or religious. And when really, the interesting thing is, even though you and I had this amazing invitation to a relationship with God, and even though we're given an invitation for others to join that, sometimes it can feel lonely. There's going to be times where you and I are the only ones who are following Christ in our family or at our job or maybe in our home or with our friends. And in those moments, all of a sudden, we feel, we feel alone. We feel like, man, God, I don't know if I can do this because the pressure to conform, the pressure, because when that happens, we have a choice to make. We can say, you know what? I'm going to continue to follow God's narrative because I know his story always ends up good. Or I can do what is right in my own eyes or in my circle of influence's eyes and I can conform. And in those moments, we have a choice whose story we're going to follow. So the question we're going to look at this morning is how can we live differently and follow God's narrative and yet not be pushing other people into trying to follow God's way? How, how do we withstand the pressures and not conform and live differently? And how do we faithfully follow Jesus and, and be influential in the, in the influence that God has given us? So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn me to Genesis chapter 6. And Genesis is really easy to find because it's the first book of the Bible. And so if you're not familiar with the Bible, then you are here on the right day because Genesis, you just open up your Bible, pass the index, and you're going to run into Genesis. And you, we're going to turn to chapter 6. The verses will be on the screen so you can follow there. Or if you have a phone, I would encourage you uh, to follow along in your version or your Bible. And we're going to look at Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. And we're going to see that when God is with you, you are never alone. And we're going to see that you may not have the backing of your teachers, the backing of your friends, the backing of your spouse, the backing of your parents. You might not have the backing of your, of your co-workers, but you're never alone. And when God calls you to do something, rest assured that he's going to walk with you. Every week at Wanda Family Church, we have a slogan. This one is super easy. Repeat it after me. If you say, one plus God is a majority. One plus God. One plus God is a majority. So when you and I feel all alone, like we are the only one, rest assured that one plus God is always a majority. 
so we can walk in confidence. And so before we read Genesis 6, 5, though, I want to give a little, little just snapshot. You know, God obviously created, did you read Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2 and 3? You see God created, you know, the heavens and the earth and Adam and Eve. And he sets Adam and Eve in the garden. And that was God's story. And Adam and Eve got to be a part of God's story. But then it became a part where Eve and Adam decided they were going to write their own story. Why? It's the same temptation you and I face every single day. And it's this temptation that somehow God is withholding something from us. Somehow that God is not giving us all that is good. And that's what Adam and Eve were convinced to believe is that, that God was withholding from them. And so they ate from the tree which they were not supposed to eat. And then they were expelled from the garden. And then God continues, if you read Genesis, he continues to give invitation upon invitation. And we as, as fallen humans continue to say, no God, I have this. I want to write my own story. And the more and more you follow, the more and more you find chaos, pain, broken relationships, and separation. All as the fruit of us writing our own narrative. And the whole time, God's heart is breaking, trying to give invitation upon invitation to say, no, no, I have a different story. I have a better story. I have a story that, that, that is good if you can just trust me. And then, however, they continue to write their own stories. And so by the time you get to Genesis 6, there's murder, there's, there's stealing, there's lying, there's manipulation, there's people following their own desires. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 is where we pick up. It says this, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Now, this is pretty bad. This, this is pointing to a time in human history which, I mean, so many people think that, you know, uh, America culture is going bad, but this is a time where it's being described as everybody's thoughts and intentions of their heart was 100% consistently, totally opposite of God's story, evil. And so what, what, what happens? Well, as we continue to read in verse uh, 6, uh, sorry, verses 7 and 9, it says this, And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I've created from this face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, large animals, small animals, scurrying along the ground, even the birds of the sky. He says, I'm sorry I ever made them. But, everyone say but. but. That's a big but. That's a big but. Noah found favor with the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Now, we're going to camp here for a minute. I want, to, I want to extract a couple different things. And the first thing is this, is this whole thing about um, uh, God, you know, bringing the flood and wiping out humanity. Because, you know, I, I watch Bill Maher every once in a while so my blood pressure can get, uh, right, you know, get up a little bit. And, uh, but no, I, 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 love, I love to hear people's thoughts and opinions, especially those who, who, uh, who think, you know, this is a fairy tale and that um, it's all made up. And, and, and they'll use something like this, saying, you know, you, you see this God in the Old Testament who's angry and mad and, and, and just wants to kill people and um, I can't serve a God who's like that. And they try to paint this picture of God being this malicious, you know, hater. And then, you know, somehow in the New Testament, it's like, you know, magical and Jesus and he's loving and he's kind and, and it's like, you know, polar opposites. And, um, but it, it's really not the case. It's really not the case. And, and the thing is, is if, you, if you look through the entire Bible, you will see God constantly giving people an invitation to follow him. And you will see constantly you and I turning our, our backs to him and doing our own thing, writing our own story. Matter of fact, in that verse, in the New Living Translation I just read, it says that God said, I'm sorry that I ever made them. But actually, the, the Hebrew word for sorry is actually more powerful. The Hebrew word in the, in the original language means regret, to console oneself, or to be moved with pity or compassion. God's heart was broken at the state 
of the world, of humanity. His heart was grieved. You know, if you've ever been a parent or a grandparent, then you can relate semi to that, is that when there's a moment when they've done something and they've hurt themselves, and you are grieved, and you are broken in, inside of you. And, and if you think about it, if God is love, which, which is what it communicates in the New Testament, then because God is love, he has the highest capacity to experience pain. Because if you can't love without pain. And so this is a picture of not an angry God who is, who is trying to vindictively wipe people out because they sin. It's a God who is broken, who has to judge sin because of his righteousness. But his heart is, is, is almost a this, this picture of a, of a tearful God having to bring something that he warned them would come if they chose that way. And that's, that's the kind of description that we see there because of God's holiness and because of his righteousness, he does not, does not tolerate sin, which is why Jesus came and died on the cross. You know, I, I'm doing this thing for school on, on suffering and th there's an age-old question that says, you know, if God is really loving, then why doesn't he do something about all the suffering in the world? And the answer is, he did. He stepped out of heaven and walked on the planet and was being spit at and mocked at. And if you are the son of God, then pull yourself down. And he had all authority and power to do so. But he chose to lay his life down so that God's wrath on sin once and all could be paid for. Wow. That's how much he loves us. That's the invitation that he gives us. But then you continue to read throughout that passage and you get to the big butt. But, so you get this grim picture, right? Humanity is falling apart. All of a sudden, you know, God's going to you know, wipe the earth clean. And then you get this big but. But Noah found favor with the Lord. And it describes him as one who lived blamelessly and walked with God in fellowship with God. Now the word blameless doesn't mean perfect. And, you know, the Bible is clear that nobody is perfect. All have sinned. But the word blameless simply means this. With integrity... Or in accordance with the truth. So what we get from this is that Noah was walking differently than the rest of culture. And this is huge. That Noah was in a very wicked, and a very, uh, in a culture that was going opposite of where God wanted them to go. It was a culture where they were writing their own narrative and they could care less about what God said. Yet we find Noah still walking with God. And so that's exciting to me because what that means is no matter how toxic of a culture this United States may get or how far your friendship circles or how far others around you at school or at your job or what is going on around us, that means you and I can still follow God. <laughs> no matter what is happening around us, that we are not alone because one plus God is a majority. And Noah is a great depiction of that because it, he was in a culture worse than a culture we are in and yet he lived in accordance with the truth. So whether it's your school, whether it's your work, whether it's your own home, whatever it may be, you could walk victoriously and you could walk close with God. Because one plus God is a majority. It doesn't matter what those around us say is the right path. We can still honor God. You know, it's just so interesting because, you know, our culture wants to define um, a thousand things of what is right and what is wrong. But you know what they really need? They don't need you and I to become better at arguing and proving our point. They don't need us to polish up our apologetics. I'll tell you what they need us to do. They need us to live a different narrative. Because what happens is, you, I think you and I have both experienced this, is that we go our own way and we start drinking from wells that we realize are running dry. Or we're running down a path and we realize it ends into a dead end alley. And it's in those moments in our brokenness we realize that we were writing our own story, going our own way, and we humble ourselves before God and we begin introduced to the, uh, the springs of living water that never run dry. And we experience His grace and His healing and His wholeness. And then all of a sudden, we, our lives are changed. But the challenge is then when we get put back into the culture, we start wanting to conform because we don't want to stand out. 
And so we find ourselves standing out for the wrong things, like for picketing and for things that we're, you know, that we're you know, really, really passionate about. And we put bumper stickers in our car. When if I believe if we were living out the gospel of Jesus Christ in our life and we were living differently, it would be a narrative that people see. Because what you and I can rest assured is those friends that you know, those family members that you know, those people, you know, your neighbors that you have, those friends at school that don't know Jesus, there's going to come a moment in their, in their life where they realize their well is run dry. And when that happens, they look up and they're looking for another narrative, but they often don't see one. Because many times we're too busy trying to conform and fit in so that we we don't feel alone. Or we don't, we don't ruffle any feathers or we don't get made fun of or we don't get misunderstood or we don't fill in the blank. But if you and I actually lived like we were called to live separate, different, look different. I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, our hair and our external things. I'm talking about internal. Like, because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's all internal. When we begin to live differently, when we respond differently at the gas station when, when, when our pump messes up, when we respond differently when our waitress drops our food right in front of us and the rest of our family is eating their food and they won't share it with us and we have to wait 15 minutes. <laughs> When we respond differently, you know, to that person at work who's being a jerk. You know, that when, when the fruit of our lives is differently, when we show the world that we are different, not just by things, yes, it does mean some things that we don't do, but it's also the things that we do. And believe it or not, the, the, uh, in a minute we're going to read a verse, and it's really interesting, the early church struggled with the same thing. Because the early church didn't go, go, go along with um, Roman entertainment. You know, Rome was not a very um, um, moral place. Let me just put it that way. And, you know, the, there was the gladiator fights that the early church didn't want to be a part of even before they were actually thrown in there, um, you, know, to, you know, to be made, made fun of and persecuted. They didn't, go on, uh, they, they didn't want to go on with the plays. There was a lot of risque plays that went on. The early church wanted to be separate. And so my question, I guess, to you is, if somebody followed your narrative, would they know it's a different narrative of someone who is not following Christ? Or, 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 let, me, let me rephrase that. Would, when they looked at your narrative, because they could be able to tell that you do follow Christ, or would it look just like everyone else? Because one plus God is a majority. And sometimes you and I are going to have to walk alone. And that's what I was referring to, is you're not really alone, because when you're connected to the body of Christ, you have brothers and sisters that are there to support you, and that's why connection groups are so important. But there's still going to come a time where you and I are going to have to stand on our own and say, you know what, I'm going to live different. I'm not going to respond like everyone else. I'm going to forgive my enemies. I'm going to bless those who persecute me. I'm going to serve those who want to hurt me. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and, and be faithful and have integrity even though everyone else around me isn't. I'm not going to cut corners. I'm going to, I'm going to live different because I got, I'm with God and God's with me. And one plus God is a majority. You know, I'm not going to try to laugh at these jokes that I know are degrading to women. I'm not going to engage in this activity because everyone else is doing it at my job. If I'm the only one and, and they may misunderstand me as pious, that's not really who I am, but that's their choice. I'm going to live different. And I'm fully convinced if the church of Jesus Christ would live God's narrative, we would see a lot more people cross the line into relationship with Jesus because they would look at our lives and say, I want that story. And you say, hey, it's not just my story. It's his story. And so will you join me on this journey 
to say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let go of my wants. Because you know the, the Bible and the Old Testament, if you read the whole Old Testament, there's one common theme, and Mike Nagel was sharing with this with me, is the people of God were described as doing what was right in their own eyes. And that's really what sin is. Sin is simply uh, an, an, an issue of the heart. Sin is simply coming face to face with God's story and going, no, God, your story back here, my story front center. That's really what sin is. Every time you and I make a, a, a sinful choice, it's because we're saying, I know better. And the whole time, God's not in heaven with a, with a lightning bolt. He's in heaven with tears down his eyes. Going, not only this time I sent my son Jesus to carry my wrath, and now you have an open invitation into a consistent relationship with me, and you're still drinking from empty cisterns and running down dead end alleys. And so, as we concluded, you know, this, I feel all alone. The reality is, yeah, there's going to be moments where you're the only one. But I'm telling you, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Stand and love and be humble and be gentle, but be strong. Stand and serve and give, but don't compromise. And don't let anybody redefine what God has already defined. And it doesn't matter who or what or what channel or what star or what celebrity. You know, now they realize that everyone has used the celebrity gig so much. Now they're trying to sell you commercials where they say, we, we could have a celebrity sell you this can of Sprite, but uh, we don't want to do that to you. So now we just want you to taste it and know that it's good. I'm like, hey, I'm like God was rid rid that was, that's from the book of Psalms here. He should get the credit for that. So the whole, the whole point is, I want you to stand. And as we close, I want to do one more illustration. Is How many of you guys ever have had an aloe vera plant in your house? Yeah. Very cool. Very popular. Um, because it's used for a lot of things, you know, homeopathic. Like a lot of people believe it has great healing agents. So they'll put it on cuts and wounds and, and different stuff like that. And then um, it's become very popular in products like the sh shampoo and lotions and, and all sorts of stuff. Even toothpaste, they'll have it in there. As a matter of fact, um, in 2015, there was over there's a 13 million dollar industry, aloe vera. In 2016, they were a lot of the experts were afraid that the demand was outgrowing the ability to produce um, aloe vera, so they were getting nervous. And so it, it's very very popular. And and the interesting thing though about about this isn't the fact that it gives you smooth skin or, or is, has the healing properties. Is if you study this plant. It, it grows and it thrives in environments that are desert and rocky. So here's this aloe vera plant that is surrounded by nothing but dirt, dust, rocks. And you would look at it and go, there's no life anywhere around it. And this is thriving. And it has roots and it gets the water and the nutrients it needs. It holds on to it. And I thought, what a great picture of a Christ follower. And this ties into our last series we did in September called Fruit Loops. If you missed that, you can catch it online. But we talked about being connected to the vine. As, as Christ followers, you and I stay connected to Him. And our life source comes from Him. Our hope comes from Him. Our strength comes from Him. Our vision comes from Him. Definitions come from Him. Everything comes from Him. And then we have that. And it doesn't matter what the soil and the environment and the culture is around us, we can still thrive. And not only can we thrive, if we're truly following God's narrative, we can be a healing agent to people around us as well. And so, just as a good reminder, I'm going to pass out this aloe vera plant. But be careful, it's got prickly, it's like a, a, a cactus, so I don't want you to get hurt. And I just want this to be a reminder to you. Hope you enjoy that. There you go. Um, the, the, fir the first gathering, the... the they, they never had one before, so they were excited. Uh, the guy was like, yeah, I'm kind of sensitive skin, so I think I'm going to bust it out and, and land it up right there, right? But um, we're called 
to live a different narrative. And there's really no other way to say it. And I think the best example of that is Jesus himself. He lived a completely different narrative. Nobody knew what was going on. The religious leaders didn't understand him. The culture didn't understand him. And yet, he was faithful to live the narrative to show the world who the Heavenly Father is. One plus God is a majority. If you could bow your heads and close your eyes as we wrap up this morning. It's been a good series. And every week at YNF Family Church, we give people an opportunity to cross the line to a relationship with Jesus. And maybe you were here today and you're like, wow, this is really interesting, um, you know, talk that you've given, but the reality is, is that God does love you and I, and that's why Jesus came. He is a full expression. Matter of fact, the Bible says Jesus is the exact representation of the Father in heaven. So everybody said, what is God like? What is God like? What is God like? And Jesus says, here I am. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if you don't have a relationship with God, but you would like to this morning, we just want to pray with you right where you're at. Just reach out to God in your heart and God's Spirit will begin to touch your life as you reach out to Him. God, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that, you, that you're with me. And God, I pray you forgive me for God writing my own story. Forgive me for pushing you out. Forgive me for thinking that um, I could be God. And I realize that there's only one God and it's, it's not me, it's you. And so Jesus, forgive me of my sins and take control of my life. I want to follow you from this day forward. I want to walk closely with you. I want there to be a big but about my life where it says, but I follow the Lord. Jesus name with heads bowed and eyes still closed if you're in the gathering you say Jeremy that was that was me I prayed with you to cross the line to relationship with Jesus with no one looking around and simply wave a finger or a hand say will you pray for me this week Jeremy that was me if there's anybody here today all right with heads bowed and eyes still closed if I have one more question for you and it's simply this is is there an area of your life where you're writing your own narrative and God loves you so much, he'll let you keep doing it. But eventually, it's going to end in a chapter that, that you wish you could take back. So why not stop now and let God continue to write your story? And so I just want to pray a prayer, a blessing over you, and let, let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. And I thank you for this uh, reminder this morning that we're called to live different. That, that we should be the most God-engaged, humble, loving, secure, confident. But God, we struggle. Lord, we see our friends, we see our job environments, we see all around us, God, and it's the pressure to conform is real. And God, there's no, there's no shame or condemnation, but there's, there's definitely a compelling, loving challenge today to say, no, I'm going to, today's the day, God, I, I'm going to begin to live your story. I'm going to live different. I'm, I'm gonna, it's okay. I might be the only one at my work. I might be the only one in my neighborhood. I might be the only one in my school. But God, I'm ready to follow you. No turning back. So God, take every area of my life. God, because I know not only will this have a, a positive and a life-giving impact, and not only will there be fruit in my own life from this decision, but God, I know as I begin to live a different, God, live your narrative and not my own, I know that those around me are going to begin to take notice. And God, I pray that you would use us to have such an amazing impact, God, on the culture around us, Lord, that, that they look at us and say, man, they don't conform. They, man, they're, they're not arrogant and they're, man, they're humble and they're loving, but they're, they're not afraid to be different. Who, who is that? Why is that? What, what kind of story are they following? And God, what an amazing opportunity in that moment we'll have to give an invitation for people to know you. God, we just, I thank you for speaking to hearts specifically today. 
And God, may every single person be willing to lay down whatever it is that you are speaking to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen.